We have been having I, such a rich series in this Psalm 23. I hope you've been enjoying it as much as I have. And, and it's been powerful as we memorize this picture of God as a loving shepherd caring for us. And, and now we're coming to some kind of interesting verses. But first, let me share with you, there's a, an image that's kind of gone viral on TikTok. And it shows the employees of this restaurant, very nice restaurant, they are crouched down behind the counter and they're eating their meal because there is so, they're so busy that they're not having time to stop and take breaks to eat, but they can't eat in front of their customers. So there are literally four of them lined up along this counter and they are just quickly grabbing something so that they can eat because the pressure of the job, because the pressure of their lives, the pressure of their bosses, is not allowing them a chance to stop and rest and eat. And maybe you relate to that. If you're working in some kind of a service industry right now, I am sure you can relate to the the craziness of somebody yelling at you because they don't want to wear a mask or yelling at you because you're not wearing a mask or whatever that is. And unfortunately, that's part of why a lot of people are quitting is the, the, the workplace for many people has become such a toxic atmosphere. And in that place, in that setting, in the place where we are, let's read this verse. It says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Sometimes when you're running through a passage that you know really well, that you're familiar with, or you've memorized, it's easy not to stop and go, what does that really mean? And here we are talking about sheep and we've talked about the green pastures and the, and the still waters. And last week we talked about the valley of the shadow of death and that the shepherd is there and his rod and his staff. And all of those are clearly sheep and shepherd pictures. And then all of a sudden we take this shift to you prepare a table before me and you're thinking, okay, <laughs> sheep don't sit at the table. They don't use knives and forks. Uh, what happened here? So there's a couple of thoughts. One is maybe this is still a sheep metaphor and the idea of preparing a table before me, this picture can also be seen as the shepherd going ahead and saying there are wonderful high tables, plateaus, mountains, um, the, the mesa is the word that we use, where the sheep can go and graze and it's a After you go through the valley, then you come to the mesa, to the table. And the picture could be that the shepherd has gone ahead to survey the difficulties, to pull out the weeds that might be poisonous. And and in fact, our book, uh, Shepherd Looks at the 23rd Psalm, that's the tack that he takes. But I really think that he's kind of switching to a different metaphor. I think David has used and talked about this picture of shepherd and sheep, and now, now he's reflecting personally on his own life and how, how God has taken care of him. And he uses this interesting image that you have set a table before me in the presence of my enemies. So the, the picture that perhaps you experienced this last week as you were having a Thanksgiving meal is way too many calories, enough to feed a, a small African village. And maybe you're also saying, oh yeah, there was a table in the presence of my enemies. <laughs> Those are my relatives. And I don't know if that was your experience or not, but, but he's drawing this beautiful picture of the fact that even though his enemies are present and trying to take him out, and even though life is hectic like it was for those restaurant workers, that his relationship with God is such that God is setting a table. And not only in every culture, but particularly in the Middle Eastern culture, the the act of stopping your routine and sitting down and eating and sharing at a table is an act of connection. It's an act of friendship. It's an act of relationship. And so he's painting this picture. And if you think about how strange this this might be, if you tried to paint the picture of it, if you've got a battle going all around and people fighting and in the middle of it, here's this dining room table and the shepherd is sitting there and his, and Jesus and his followers or Jesus and you and I are sitting there and, and we are enjoying a time of conversation and eating and, and peacefulness. And maybe you have a hard time recognizing that or reflecting on that. And in fact, I think 
that we live in a time when many, many people feel unsafe. The people who've gone through uh, abusive situations often have what's called hypervigilance, where they are looking around all the time and scanning for where the, the danger might come from. People who've been through traumatic events and have PTSD, people who are very, very concerned about the virus or very, very divisive and, f and frustrated with people who disagree with them. It, it can be a, a time right now where people are looking everywhere and feel like there's nowhere I really feel safe. And some people are retreating back because of that. And instead of that, David says, in the middle of the battle, I am sitting at the table that God has prepared for me and we are having fellowship. And as I thought about that, I thought of the, the verse in Revelation 3.20 where Jesus said, here I am. I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with that person and they with me. It's, it's a statement he makes to one of the churches in Revelation that I am trying to connect with you at that personal, intimate, deep level. And I don't know if you relate to that. I don't know if you have that sense that God is your, your companion and, and cares for you and not, not like your buddy buddy, but that there's this intimate, close connection that you can actually envision Jesus coming into your home and, and you sitting and talking and sharing on that kind of a level. I, I hope that when you wake up in the morning and you spend some time reading the scripture and praying that, that there is that sense of I'm stopping everything so that I can spend time with you. I know one of the things that often comes up to my mind is as soon as this is over, then I'll be able to do that. And I don't know if you live in that world too. As soon as things aren't so busy, as soon as the kids are out of the home, as, as soon as I get my life straightened out, as soon as I make this much money, as soon as I get that problem solved, then I can have a peace with God. And what I love about this, this kind of weird phrase is he said, you set the table before me in the presence of my enemies. They are still all there. I don't have to wait until the enemies are all gone, until everything is, is settled out, that God is inviting me to experience peace in the middle of chaos. He's inviting me to sit and have fellowship with him in spite of the fact that all of these difficulties are around me. And the Bible is very clear that the enemy is real. Now, in a human sense, David had enemies his whole life. If you think about the story of David's life, his first part of his life, he was being pursued by Saul, the king of Israel. And sometimes he came after him with troops and, and David was hiding in caves and trying to find a place to eat and a, a place to, to be safe. And then later he becomes king and you think, well, now he's got it made. And after a period of years, his son starts raising up against him and causing a, a rebellion, an insurrection, and eventually... He has to run for his life and, and then ultimately his son is killed in that, in that battle. And then at the end of his life where he's chosen Solomon to be his heir, he has another son, Adonijah, who comes in and tries to take the kingdom. And you realize David's life was full of not only the enemies of Israel, but of all of the people around him. And he said, in spite of that, I can still have that quiet, fellowship connection with God. In, in fact, David is described a couple of places as someone who has a heart after God, that he sought to listen and to follow and to respond. In the middle of all of the things that were going on, he had a chance to have a relationship with God. I don't know what's going on in your life, but I know that it is so easy to get up in the morning and to have all of the obstacles and all of the difficulties of our life just look huge. That all of the things I gotta tick off on my list of the, the losses that I've experienced, of the, the, the problems that have to be solved. And I know even when I sit down to read and pray, sometimes those, those things are, are magnified in my mind. And I think one of the purposes of sitting at the table Letting the Lord come in the door and sitting and talking with him is to get an idea of who God is 
and what he's doing for us and what he's wanting to do in us. And when I, when I get my focus on God, then he gets to be bigger than my problems. But when my focus is on the news and on the world and on my difficulties, then somehow God gets pushed to the side. So I think really this statement, he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies, is really an invitation not to wait till everything gets settled out, not to wait till finally something changes, but to realize that every single day I need to again go into the presence of God. I need to sit and learn how to listen to his voice. I need to learn how to speak and share my heart with him with whatever's going on. And I need to get my head straight before I head out into the day. And I think this is, this is a beautiful picture of that. It's a beautiful invitation. And a couple of Sundays ago, we talked about how we all have hot spots. That those spots cause us to overreact, cause us to feel fearful and anxious. And, and this is the place to take your hot spots. This is the ta- place to take your sore spots. This is the place to take them into the presence of Jesus and spend time there. And I know that often we, we feel like I don't have time for it and, and it doesn't help me and, and we may have a lot of excuses, but that's what we need to start with. And then he goes on and he switches the metaphor again and he says, my head is anointed. So he talks about a, a cultural thing that you and I probably don't relate to, that anointing or putting oil on somebody's head it was a way of honoring. And there are different individuals in the Old Testament that were anointed with oil. And in fact, uh, when they anointed the high priest, it talks about it runs down on his beard and down his garments and, and this picture. They didn't just do a little dab. This was a pouring of oil. And that, that picture is for honoring somebody. Now in our culture, if you bring somebody up front and you pin a badge on them, or if you put them on a podium and they get to be on the top and you play their national anthem, or you get a medal around your neck or a, a fancy big ring, those, those are ways in our culture of saying, ah, this person is an honored person. But in this culture, to be anointed is to honor, to have the oil poured over. And again, we can ask, what picture is this? Because as Pastor Jason mentioned in the second week, uh, a shepherd will anoint his sheep. In fact, it's part of that tender picture that, that when the shepherd is looking over his sheep and caring for them, if there's places where they've got wounds or infections, he puts oil on that as a, as a way to bring healing. And it, it may help with the flies and the mites not to, to get into their eyes and their nose and the things that, that are causing them discomfort. And it, it could be just talking about how sheep are lovingly and carefully anointed. But I think if you look at David's life, there is really an important picture here because not only were sheep anointed, but in their culture, that was the way that a king was shown to be either now the king or soon to be the king. It would be like placing the crown on the head for a European culture. And if you think of David's life, this was a huge moment for David. And if you We'll read the devotions this week back in 1 Samuel 16. There's an incredible story. And let me just tell a little bit to you where Saul had been the king and God said, I've rejected him. He's quit following me and and I'm gonna choose a new king. And so he sent Samuel down to Bethlehem. He said, I want you to go to this guy's house named Jesse. And he has, one of his sons is going to be the king. And of course, If you think about the logistics of this, if you're going to crown the new king when the other king's still living, it's probably, it better be a a undercover operation. So he kind of sneaks down to Bethlehem and he calls Jesse and all of his sons together. And and he begins to look down the row at these strong, fine young men. And he looks at the oldest one and he says, oh, Eliab, yeah, man, he looks kingly. He looks like tall, good looking, seems to have a commanding presence. And God's got a different point of view. In fact, the first king, Saul, it says he stood head and shoulders above everybody. He, he looked kingly, but his heart didn't follow God. And so as, as Samuel is looking at Eliab and as he's thinking of these boys and how they will be good kings, here's what God says to him. The Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. The Lord looks at, the people look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so he goes down 
Jesse's sons. And he's like, nope, 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 nope. And finally, he looks at Jesse and he says, don't you have any other sons? And in a, an experience that I'm guessing probably Mark David for his whole life, the dad says, well, pff, yeah, there's the runt. There's David. He's out watching the sheep. And you realize that that Samuel was coming to anoint the next king and Jesse didn't even bother to call him in for consideration. He had all these other good looking sons. And so they wait because Samuel says, we're not sitting down until David gets here. And when he comes in the door, God's spirit says to Samuel, that's him, that's the man. And so before they sat down to eat, Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. You see, God looked on David's heart and he said, this is the one I want. This is the one that's going to be the king that will follow me. And then he says, and I, and I think this is an important verse to tie the two things together, that this idea of being anointed is often connected with the, the spirit filling them. And you may or may not realize that in the Old Testament, the believer's relationship with the Holy Spirit was different. That in the Old Testament, if you read carefully, the Holy Spirit would come on individuals. Generally, those were leadership people, those were people who were, had some specific task, and the Spirit would come on them for empowering them for some specific task or, or time period. And then the Spirit could leave them And in fact, if you read some of the Psalms, David prays, Lord, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. As David has sinned in Psalm 51, he's concerned that just like he he knew Saul had had the Spirit of God and then had lost it. And now he's thinking the same thing might happen to him. And so that picture that says God chose him and anointed him and then the Spirit of God came powerfully on him, that is a beautiful picture of what you and I as New Testament believers are given as our birthright. That we are not given the spirit once in a while if needed and it's only for leaders and only for a particular period of time. That anybody who comes a follower of Jesus, they are given the spirit of God. And, and just like that picture of the oil being poured over David, so the spirit of God is, is given to us only It's given as a birthright, and I'll show you in just a second where that picture carries through. Because I think he goes on to the next part of that statement, and you and I need to reflect, what does that mean for me? Sheep are anointed, David was anointed, but not me. I think a lot of people feel like, I I don't have stellar gifts, I can't stand up in front of anybody, I can't sing that well, Uh, I don't have a commanding knowledge of scripture. Why would God ever choose me? And I want to tell you, God loves to choose ordinary people. He loves to choose people that you think, man, that, that person, they can barely navigate out of, their own, out of their own house, let alone lead something. And God loves to choose people that the world passes over, that the world says they don't look impressive, they're not very tall, they're not very good looking, they're not very talented. And God loves to pick them and say, that's my guy. As we did my father's memorial service, I I was really struck that that my dad was one of those people that God grabbed out of of a mess of a life and he got a hold of him. And my dad had modest talents in many categories and yet he was faithful and he followed God. And because of that, as we shared at his memorial service, there were many lives that have been transformed, including my own, because somebody was faithfully doing what God called him to do. And so God chose David and God chooses you whether you believe it or not let me show you this verse from 2 Corinthians Paul says now it is God who makes both us and you us the apostles and the leaders and you the people who were in this messed up church at Corinth he says he anointed us and set his seal of ownership on us and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come So when you read Psalm 23 that says, you've anointed my head with oil, you can speak personally. God, you have chosen me. You have adopted me into your family. You have given me life. If indeed you have given your life to Christ and surrendered to him, 
than even that picture where he says, my cup overflows. And I think it switches slightly from the oil over the head to this picture of abundance and bounty. And if you think of, of a, a cup that has been filled up to the very brim and then there's more on top and so that it actually flows over and runs out. And David said, when I look, God, at how good you've been to me, when I look at my life, that's what it feels like. It feels like you have filled me up to the very top and in fact, I'm flowing over the top. And not in spite of many difficulties that David had to go through in many, many places in his life where after he was anointed, he, he had to wait more than 10 years before he actually became the full king of all of Israel. And don't you think in that period of time it would have been easy to say, but God, you promised, and how come it's not happening? And, and I get so impatient. And instead, and instead of looking at the, the losses, the disappointments, the difficulties, he chose to focus on the goodness of God. Did you hear that? That's a choice you and I make every day that you can get up and you can add together all of the disappointments of other people and all the ways that the world's not like you want it to be and you can be filled with angst and anxiety and bitterness and you wouldn't say my cup overflows. But if we spend that time at the table with the Lord, if we begin to get our our focus on God and what he's promised, in fact, it's an amazing picture of the goodness of God. David says, God, you have been so good to me. And at times, even in his prayer, it's like I was just a shepherd boy out on the hillside and you picked me not only to be the king of Israel, but you promised me that every, every one of my generations after me would have somebody ruling on the throne that would be part of the king, the kingly line of David. And, and in fact, that pointed to Jesus. So it's a picture of God is pouring his goodness into us and we have the potential to be overflowing. In fact, 2 Peter says this, his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. God is willing to pour so much into your life. And he says, through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness, he's given us everything that's needed for a godly life. But I think there's also another powerful piece to this picture of of an overflowing cup. And I want you to think about this because I think this is an important part of how we see our life and how we progress in our our maturing in our relationship with Christ. The idea is that, that God is pouring into us and he is filling us up. And when you give yourself to Christ, that you, immediately you get all of God's spirit available to you. He doesn't dole out a little bit here and a little bit there. But the command of scripture is that we keep on being filled. And I think this is how it works, is that you can't fill a cup with water when it's full of mud. Let me explain. So if you have a cup and it's like seven eighths full of mud, you can pour water into it, but at a certain short little place, it starts just running out over the top and it is no longer filling that individual and becoming becoming useful to that cup. So I think what God does is he uses circumstances to scoop some of that mud out. He uses difficulties to scoop some of that mud out. He uses people in our lives, sometimes godly people who are great examples of humility and of gentleness and he scoops some of that mud out. And sometimes it's people that irritate us and people that push our buttons and God gives us a chance to respond to his spirit and to be filled with joy and peace and he scoops some of that mud out. And God gives you all of his spirit to begin with, but we don't have very much capacity to receive it. And if we listen, if we're the kind of sheep that listen to the master's voice, then as the process goes down the road, and God scoops those things out if we, if we respond to him, if we listen to him, and he scoops and he scoops until the spirit can fill us more and more and more. And hopefully, from the time you give your life to Christ till the time you go home to be with him, there's a process of what we call sanctification, of growth and of change, but it's also of this scooping out of myself so that God has more room to fill. In fact, one of the simple little phrases I like is when John the Baptist had prepared the way for Jesus and then he hands off and he says, okay, now go follow him. And when his disciples were feeling jealous, he said, let me tell you how this works. I must decrease and he must increase. 
And I think that's a great picture for this overflowing cup. That I must decrease, that I have to have that, that old selfishness, that relying on my strength and my will and my ways, the trying to get the emotions that I want to have and trying to have my life be the center that is, as God scoops that out, then he begins to fill me more and more with his spirit. And the overflow is then not only the fruit of the spirit, but then I have, I have that life that other people can partake of. That when Jesus was talking to the woman of the well, he said, if you drink of this water, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water that not only will I be nourished and full and, and rejoicing in my relationship with the shepherd, but that it will provide for others to drink and for others to find the Savior. And so I don't know if your life feels more like somebody sitting behind the counter trying to grab a quick meal because my life is so chaotic. But let me invite you to find time to sit at the table, even in the presence of your enemies, to allow the Spirit of God to not only anoint you and choose you, but to fill you and allow him to scoop out all of the things that are full of me so that I can be full of him. I hope that's a powerful picture that carries you through this week in the midst of whatever's going on in your life and that you would focus on the goodness of God instead of the chaos of the world and that you would find that rest and, and that safety in the world that's unsafe and not, not very restful. Thanks for joining us wherever you're watching online or at, at one of the campuses. I'm gonna turn it over to the campus pastors and they'll take you to a couple of other steps.